present your word. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. 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 A, DEA, a DEA officer stopped at a ranch in Texas and talked with an old rancher. He told the rancher, I need to inspect your ranch for illegally grown drugs. The rancher said, okay, but don't go in that field over there, as he pointed out the location. The DA officer verbally exploded, saying, Mister, I have the authority of the federal government with me. Reaching into his rear pants pocket, he removed his badge and proudly displayed it to the rancher. See this badge? This badge means I'm allowed to go wherever I wish on any land. No questions asked or answers given. Have I made myself clear? Do you understand? The rancher nodded, politely apologized, and went about his chores. A short time later, the old rancher heard loud screams, looked up, and saw the DEA officer running for his life, being chased by the rancher's big Santa Gertie bull. With every step, the bull was gaining ground on the officer, and it seemed likely that he'd sure enough get gollard, gollard before he reached safety. The officer was clearly terrified. The rancher threw down his tools, ran to the fence, and yelled at the top of his lungs, Your badge! Show him your badge! <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> in spite of the relative misuse of authority... You're back with me? <laughs> authority is very important to God. Starting with declaring and affirming his own authority, God, throughout Scripture, set, reminds us that He is in charge. Culminating in the reality that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is <coughs> Lord. Amen. God then establishes His authority in His most fundamental institution, the family, placing husbands over wives and parents over children. And not for authority to be abused naturally, but so we can glean the value from it that God intends. And then God places authority in government and the church. And I should be in Romans chapter 13 already, but where God says there in terms of just reminding us why he, why he has given us uh, the authority he's given us in government. But he says here in 13, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that God, is, that God have, have been established by, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authorities, rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And so therefore, when we think of what we have in Numbers 12, where we are this morning, that really is what it is all about in terms of God just reinforcing the authority of Moses, which we, he really would seek to do with all authority. Again, we have to see why God has established authority in this earth as an expression of his own authority and, again, the benefit that comes to us. And that really does explain why God does what he does in um, Numbers chapter 12. So as we turn to Numbers 12, we also see a connection between Romans 12 and 11. People complaining just in another context. The people really were saying, uh, you know, to God or to Moses, that this man and this man and this man. And what we find in Numbers 12 is Miriam and Aaron saying, oh, this Moses, this Moses, this Moses. And what I see in both contexts is God would say, you were really complaining against me and rejecting me. And that is why it's important to see that every sin, every act of independence from God is a form of complaint against him, saying his provision or direction or standard is not good enough and we know a better way. And it's important to know that we when we bring our that, that we can bring our complaining to God. You know, I was asked that at the Thursday morning Bible study, you know, is it okay when we are complaining if we're complaining to God? And I said, yes, absolutely that's true. You know, when you look at the Psalms, you look at what David writes there and other Psalmists in terms of then bringing the issues of life, bringing their emotions, bringing their heart hurts and their frustration, and bringing it to God. But I think when we do that, we bring it to God for Him to again give us the godly resolution. Well, what, what is the good effect? What is the thing that I can do ultimately to, to cooperate with you, God, in terms of what you're trying to establish? 
what you're trying to do in terms of fixing the problems that my complaining might be the thing that identifies the problem, but you have a path and you have a provision for me to uh, work with you in that. See, ultimately, when we think about now on the earthly level, it really is legitimate to address problems directly, humbly, and scripturally, to become an agent of change in a situation that brings things more in line with what God would have us do. So like I said last week, fixing things, cooperating in change, not just complaining about them. So as we turn to Numbers chapter 12, and before we really get into that passage, I'd like us to consider three reasons why God has established authority. See, to me, in some ways, when we get into Numbers chapter 12, we might say to ourselves, well, what's the big deal? Why is God being so firm in the situation in terms of addressing Miriam, particularly and Aaron, in terms of what they have done? And I think it is about the three reasons why God has established authority. I think first, authority defines things and thereby fosters unity. Authority defines things and thereby fosters unity. You know, we've heard the old adage that a lot of cooks spoil the soup. And basically what I see in that is a principle in terms of what authority brings to a situation where ultimately when you think of any one person making soup, basically that soup is going to be what it's going to be. It's going to have the ingredients it's going to have. And it would be, you know, based on what this person's ability was in making soup. But basically, if you now are getting a team of people together where you're serving soup to a hundred people, and now all of a sudden a decision has to be made, what kind of soup are we making? What are the spices? What are the ingredients? I mean, just imagine being a worker on the line and you're cutting up vegetables and one person comes and says, hey, cut up carrots, and, and that's what you're going to do. And then, oh, no, 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 we don't want to cut up carrots. We don't want to carrots. No, no, you, someone else comes over and says, no, why don't you call it settled celery? And then someone else comes along and says, no, 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 it's not going to be carrots and celery. We're going to put turnips in this soup. So you get what I'm saying? That ultimately, at some point in time, and, you know, when it comes to certain things that we're accomplishing for the kingdom of God, for different scenarios, that what we're doing is, is, is in terms of whatever activity is happening, it's not really the, the main issue. The main issue is the unity that we have in pursuing that course. In other words, what soup is being made, oftentimes, what thing we're actually doing, again, may, may not be the main issue, but it may mean how coordinated are we, how, how united are we in terms of pursuing that thing. You know, when I think of, you know, what we do in terms of the church, or, you know, what are we going to do in terms of evangelism, what are we going to do in terms of instructing kids, or having VBS, or doing this program or that program to fulfill the purposes God gives us to worship God, to edify believers, and to reach out to the world. And there are a lot of things we could come up with in terms of what we do. But what is more important sometimes in terms of not so much what we do, but how united are we in that process. And so therefore, one benefit that authority brings, what leadership brings, is they define things. Okay, we are going to do this. We are going in this direction. And so now, basically, that, that provides a focal point. That provides something in terms of pursuing the good. Now, and it's good for us in terms of thinking about authority in the church, that the scripture is always the reference point in terms of just what we are doing and what we're pursuing. But when we think about what authority brings, really in any context, it defines things. Again, it gives a focal point that people then can unify around. And I think that's one purpose that God saw in giving us authority and why he's so serious about it. I think another thing that's, that authority provides is vision and oversight. It is always valuable to have someone who is thinking above and beyond what is being done and giving direction, a direction based on what they are able to observe because they are not actually doing the work. You know, we see this in sports and in business all the time. You know, I'm amazed in terms of the sports context of this where you have professional athletes where again, you, know, you, you, know, you have guys that are far better than the coach on the sidelines. They know basketball, they know football, they know how to throw a pitch or whatever. But you know something? They still put themselves under authority, of this, under this guy, 
that again has the ultimate vision, has the ultimate responsible responsibility to see the big picture and the value that comes in that person having authority in that situation. And I love when that guy is like the scrawny, unathletic guy. That again, these big hulking football players, these linemen that are coming over, they could literally like crush this guy. But they understand the value of authority. That ultimately he has a perspective, he has an insight, he has a, a tool, an ability of observation and internalizing things that now provides a direction. And again, that's the value of authority. I think this is what is behind Acts chapter 6. When the apostles are confronted with the needs of the church and all these different things are coming up in terms of what they should address and how they should address it and what the needs are and so on and so forth. And they say, wait, wait, wait a minute, this is distracting us from that place of, of, of vision and priority and connecting with God. So pick seven men. Take guys that are going to be able to deal with these things. So what can we do? Commit ourselves to the word and to prayer. And so again, that's, we need to maintain the connection with God. We need to maintain his vision and his priority in terms of what he would have to do. And again, that's another value of authority. And a third value of authority, again, that I think that is why it's important to God, is there is a need at times to correct. There is a need to address the rebellion and ultimately the harm that evil people could bring to others. I mean, ultimately, it's another point that, that Paul makes in Romans chapter 13 when he talks about the sword that authority has. And he says, that sword is not given to authority, so they stop good people from doing good things. That sword is given to stop bad people from doing bad things. You know, that's why as you continue to read in Romans 13 there, you see, you know, the Apostle Paul is saying, respect that authority, pray for that authority, but ultimately to recognize that just do good. Like, and ultimately, if you continue to do good, you have no fear of that authority. Now, I think there is an aspect in terms of the modern day and, and how the, the Bible says that good will be, be called bad and bad will be called good. And so there's an aspect of us continuing to recognize God as our ultimate authority and continue to do things that he says is good, even if that is contrary to the, to the authority that exists in this, in this world. Uh, but ultimately, to still think of why God gives authority. Because you know something? There is evil. There is evil inside of us. There, there are people certainly outside of Christ that, that would come against us in, in our individual lives. Or, you know, when you think about the Bible talking about wheats and tares and how the wheats and the tares are, are grown together. You know, so there could be tears amongst us at some point in time. I'm not looking at anyone at this point. No, so, so, but, but to recognize that that's a principle of Scripture, so that's something that authority is placed and in, in, put in place to guard against that, to protect and to correct when that is necessary. So again, that's not the extensive observation or, or, or delineation of why God has established authority. But when you think about, again... What it gives in terms of defining things and providing unity. What it provides in terms of vision and direction. And what it provides in terms of correction. I think those are three of the essential parts of why God establishes authority in the first place. And so now as we turn to Romans chapter, I mean Romans, to uh, Numbers chapter 12. Again we see why God is so serious about what he's doing in this situation. And so therefore as you... Uh, uh, hopefully you're already there in Numbers chapter 12. And you see here in verse 1 and 2, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. You know, uh, the, the, the first verse here really does talk about one thing that complainers tend to do is they tend not to address the issue that is at hand, but really bringing up something that is a sidebar or, or, or something that might be more easily addressed or, or, or might fire people up more in terms of what they're complaining about. But when we think about what this means in terms of Moses taking a Cushite, Cushite wife, I mean, at this point in time, Zipporah, the, the woman that he married in Exodus, is no more mention of her. 
So commentators think that Zipporah, if, if Zipporah has passed away, there would be no standard that Moses would be breaking in terms of taking a, Cush, taking a Cushite wife. Like that he was, he was commanded not to take wives from the land of Canaan, but Cush is not from the land of Canaan. And so therefore, there's nothing that would be against. But because she's of a different race, because she's of a different uh, ethnicity or whatever, what disruption that would cause in terms of what Miriam is trying to point out. But really, it is the second verse that brings up the most important issue. What, what she is really trying to address it says, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They ask, has he also spoken through us? You know, we have to understand that Moses, uh, Aaron, and Miriam were all uh, significant leaders in terms of the people of Israel. They were siblings in, in, in terms of just their family relationship. But it's clear that they had positions of influence. Certainly Moses and Aaron being more clear, but Miriam also, with, with the women, the fact that she prophesied at one point in terms of God speaking through her, you know, again, a person of influence. Some actually wonder, is Miriam feeling threatened in terms of his, her role when in chapter 11 of the book of Numbers, 70 other people receive the Spirit, they, they, they join Moses in terms of leadership, and so basically, is Miriam feeling threatened by that in terms of, so what does this mean to me to the extent that I've had an expression of the Spirit in my life? Now, now all these other people receive that too? And you know, so we just have to be aware when our argument, our defense, our complaint has to do with us. You know, the minute we're talking about me instead of we, I'm talking about me instead of God, that's not a good place to be in. And ultimately, that's what we see in terms of Miriam. Again, not, not, not coming to God in terms of, God, what is my place? What do you want me to do? Well, what, again, what, what's the good, the good ministry that you would have me perform? How would you have me take the giftedness that I do have and the place that I do have amongst the community of Israel and just live that out in terms of who you've made me to be? No, my reference point is Moses. And wait a minute, if he's being predominant amongst, you know, the sibling rivalry thing, if he's more important in the economy of God and regard to the people of Israel, well, you know something, he's not the only one that God speaks through. He's not the only one that God speaks to. And again, so Miriam is bringing this argument. And it is Miriam and, and, and Aaron, but uh, commentators do believe that Miriam was the initiator for this. Uh, she is listed before Aaron. In terms of this, and she is the only one that receives punishment or judgment or a consequence for the decision that she's making and the thing that she's bringing against Moses. And it's interesting that after uh, Miriam brings this attack against Moses, that ultimately chapter, verse 3 of chapter 12 really talks about how Moses is. You know, when we think about how we would want to be, as we think about the relationship with God that uh, future verses is going to point to in terms of Moses and his relationship with God, we can see one reason why that was the case. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And so it's like, really Miriam, you're going to come against Moses? You're going to come against this man that, who knows what this means in terms of how Moses conducted himself? But again, he wasn't clearly this authoritative, I'm going to beat you down, I'm going to tell you what's up, and this is what we're doing, so get, get on board. My way or the highway. No, there was a humility about Moses in terms of what he internalized, that even, even if God places me in a position of leadership, I'm under him. And so therefore, now what I communicate isn't about what I want, about who I am, but it's about who God is. And that's a beautiful thing about leadership in the kingdom, that also we maintain a position of humility because we are still nothing even as we're being used by God, and he is the one that gets the credit. He is the one that gets the glory. So it's clear that Moses internalized that, internalized that and it really reflected in terms of the kind of man that he was. Something for us to model, but clearly a contrast a juxtaposition, if you will, 
Two things set side by side for the sake of comparison. Basically, Miriam's assault on him, uh, Mary, Mary's complaint, Miriam's attack, and what Moses' character truly was. Well, look at how God acts. Again, his expression of, I care about authority. Authority is important to me. What is, what, what, what does, what, what's reflected here in terms of uh, the, the rest of the passage? It says that once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. See, it's interesting that in verse 2 it says, And the Lord heard this, and then after the parentheses, at once the Lord said to Moses. That ultimately, this is something that's, that's instant. This is something that's, that's uh, uh, immediate in terms of how uh, God is addressing this in terms of Miriam, uh, the situation here in Israel. So he acts quickly, and he acts directly. And once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. Then the cloud of the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance of the tent, of, uh, tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When both, of them, uh, when both of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. And so again, God is addressing this directly. He's not going to this guy or that guy to talk to Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. He's addressing the situation directly to him. And again, that, that, that is also a good pattern. I kind of mentioned it in the, my in introductory commentaries about how we address conflict, how we deal with how we deal with issues. Again, just because God says don't be a complainer, it doesn't mean you don't notice things that are broken that need to be fixed. Where, where, again, there's something that God would initiate or improve or change. But again, the way you do that in terms of our ministry to individual lives, the way we operate in ministry is, again, be a, be a, um, a cooperator in terms of bringing issues forth in terms of directly. And God is doing that with Aaron and Miriam here. And so just listen to the words that, Moses, that, that God speaks about Moses here. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams, but this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. When, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You know, basically, what, I mean, just, just, you know, I, I think of being a fly on the wall a lot of times when I read the Bible. I'm not sure if you think like, but just what it would it be like to be here? Just imagine go, you know, being called to the tent. Of, you talk about coming to the principal's office. This is like exponentially greater than that in terms of the jig is up. You're in trouble. You're going to confront God. And before he, before he de declares and activates his judgment on Mary, he says, let me tell you why I'm doing it. That ultimately you have to understand who your brother is. You, can, you have to understand uh, what, how, my, what my regard is for him. So basically, if that is the reference point, see again, if God has established the authority, then how dare you defy that? How dare you think little of what God prioritizes? And so just in case you, recognize, you don't recognize that Moses is in the position, not just because I declared it, not just because I put him in place, but the kind of man that he is, the kind of relationship that he has. See, I like what this statement says about Moses. I like even more what it says about God. I mean, clearly we see that humility is a key aspect. We saw this at the uh, appointment on Thursday, that humility is a key aspect of what connects us to God. I mean, basically, when we think about what God asked of us in terms of approaching him, it's faith, it's humility, and it's will. And with those three things, that's the basis on which we come to God. And to recognize that Moses was that kind of man, that's what allowed his, this relationship with God to be active in his life. And so basically, uh, not only though that it say, say something about Moses, but it says something about God. I mean, just think about how, what a personal expression this is of the kind of God he is in terms of engaging with a man like this. That ultimately, I'm willing to speak to him like you speak to a friend, like you speak to a family member, like you speak to someone that's close to you. That it's not quite face to face, because you can't do that with God, but as much as you can, as close as a human being could be to God, Moses was to him. And so therefore, when you're messing with Moses, you're messing with me. 
And so it's just a neat picture to me of, of what God ultimately calls us to. You know, and how close we get to God, what we, I mean, we, we can trust God for how He chooses to manifest Himself to us. What we don't want to be lacking in is the effort He asks of us to approach Him. You know, in terms of whatever, whatever God might do in terms of revelation of the Word, or in, insight into the Word, or the Holy Spirit revealing things, or miracles that happen in your life. I personally find that to be very different amongst Christians. And when we think about why that might be in terms of what God might be doing in terms of someone's personal life and, and encourage them and building them up in their faith or building them up in their relationship with Him. And then, and then someone else being something different in terms of how they're engaging with God. See, how God reveals Himself, what God accomplishes, what God does. Like if you look at someone else's life and say, wait a minute, I've got this sickness, this person got this sickness, they get healed and I don't. What's up with that? Well, what's up with that is that God is not different. God doesn't like them better than he likes you. But basically, God just might be accomplishing different purposes in each situation. But all I'm saying is that is up to God. What we want to make sure of is that we're not presenting a block that stops him from doing the maximum for us. Like maybe none of us would ever get to the point that Moses is. That's kind of the point that I'm making. But who knows in terms of what God might be willing to do as we come to God in humility, in faith, with will, with faithfulness, with obedience in terms of regard for Him and following Him. That again, as I'm doing all that I can to engage with the things that God gives me to engage in, I draw near to God and God promises to draw near to me. And again, this, this is one of the better pictures in terms of what the Bible describes about the personal relationship that one man had with God. And so God is, but, but in the context of authority, but God is saying, don't mess with this. Now look at verse 9. The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam, leprous like snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had leprosy. And he said to Moses, please, my Lord, do not hold against the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its womb with its flesh eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Can find her outside the camp for seven days? After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until she was brought back. After that, the people left Hezeroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. And so you see what's happening here? That, that Aaron ultimately is the one that's recognizing what God has said. He's recognizing the right response. That okay, I was over here. This is what I cooperated with, what I joined my sister in in terms of grumbling against Moses. But now I recognize that I'm wrong. So please, Moses, do something. See, I recognize that you are the vehicle. You, God just told me you're the contact point. So if I want God to do something, <laughs> I want to go to you, you're the contact point. I mean, good for us that Jesus, through Jesus, we, we all have a relationship with God in terms of Jesus being our contact point. But ultimately, Aaron is going through Moses. And just think about Moses here. I mean, do you see the humility in action? That in fact, see, to me, to me, what I might do, you know something, God, I'm not, why heal her? She was just complaining against me. She was just, you know, trying to rile the people. Who knows what happened? And she got my brother along with her. Who else did she talk to in terms of questioning my authority amongst the people? So it would be very tempting to say, well, you know, leprosy for a couple of days might not be a bad thing. <laughs> you know, who knows what? Who, again, the ways we may start thinking, but merciful, humble God healer. You know, and, and in other words, if I am the point of contact, if I am the one with the relationship, and I have the means to bring, because the offense is against me, and I'm telling you that I forgive her, so therefore now, God, you bring healing that's commensurate. And so basically, Moses, again, uh, showing his character, and God honoring that, and healing her, but it's still not without consequence. Mm -hmm. See, and don't miss that. 
That he, when, we, when we defy God's standards, when we do things independent of Him, we can come to Him in confession, and the forgiveness can be there. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that may not stop the consequences. That may not stop the effect on other people. You know, don't miss that. That ultimately when we're doing wrong things before God, we can't expect there's not going to be fallout in terms of how other people are affected. You know, just imagine what it's like to be Miriam again. Where again, you're, you're brought into the presence of God. God declares this about your brother. The cloud lifts and you're the one with leprosy. Clearly something has happened to her where there's something different operating her body. Aaron then goes to her brother says, hey, heal her. And we, don't, we really don't know in terms of what the Bible says. For that seven days, did she have the leprosy and then was healed when she came back? Or did she, was she healed in that moment, but then because of the skin infection, had to be purified and had to be uh, seen by the priest to confirm that she was free of the disease so it didn't inflict the health standard of the people of Israel. But just imagine coming back to the camp where we're seven days late because of her. You know, so ultimately, if it would have been better weather, like on the day we get to Paran, than it was when we did, or, you know, if we, I don't know, I'm trying to make a joke where there might not be a joke. <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, in other words, that, that, that what we know is the people of Israel, in terms of the cloud moving, whatever God would have, maybe he would have gone in three days, or two days, or maybe it would have been the day that she brought this up. But at least for some time, all of Israel was held up because of Miriam. And so just imagine coming back to camp and realizing, yeah, yeah, I'm the reason why, you know, this, this whole assembly, this whole people has been affected by what God did to me because of what I did to my brother. And so again, to me, it is all talking about how God cares about authority. And he is going to do things to defend authority in our lives. And so when we understand all authority flows from him, when we understand the Per, the paradigms, the relationships, the people that he has placed in authority, that we are wise to follow that authority. We are wise to come under God when we're coming under an earthly authority and do that for God's sake. Now naturally I could say a lot that I don't have time for, but I've said it in other contexts in terms of the nature of that authority. That just because we are people in the position of authority, God calls us to servant leadership. But there's really no time in terms of us doing communion, communion and uh, honoring our Lord in terms of that. So let's bow and let's pray. Father, we just do come before you and, and when, when we think about just how important authority is to you and how in various times you affirm that. And Numbers 12 is one of them. And Father, we recognize that in talking about your authority, it's hard not to think about how authority has been abused in our lives personally, in our society, in our history. But Father, that really doesn't compromise that just how important authority is to you. And so Father, I, I do pray uh, for us, for us who are in authority, that we ref reflect the kind of authority that Jesus had, uh, a servant leadership that guides an example that ultimately leads with uh, compassion and with love and understanding, making our leadership about truth and about others than about ourselves. But Father, for those of us that are under authority, and, and, well, and we all are, we are all under your authority. And so Father, I just pray you help us to internalize what that means in terms of humility, what it means in terms of obedience, what it means in terms of just recognizing you for who you are. And Father, we just uh, ask that now you prepare us for this time of communion. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.